Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, on the table center, what I thought I'd do today is walk through 150 slides about the state of, you know, no, 25 slides, about the state of the world, how we got here, and what's going to happen next. And a question that we always wrestle with is this question. Is the future of TV and film going to be disrupted at the speed and the duration of the music industry or magazine industry? So what is the future hold and what is that speed of change? Now this is a subject I actually know too much about. Um, I started my career before, before an analyst working at Time Incorporated uh, in the 90s. And I left in 1998 to go to Sanford Bernstein where I got to cover the music industry. That was my first sector I covered. And we knew right away it was a disaster. Um, and the speed at which things unraveled was, was shocking. I then moved on to 2005 and got to cover US media. Uh, in 2013, I left uh, the, the banking side and joined my partner Craig Moffin and started a new firm called Moffin Nathanson. That was with four other partners. And then uh, three years ago, we added the digital advertising world. Given the speed of change that was happening in media, we were not doing ourselves a service um, by ignoring what was happening on digital. So we now combine it from one, one combined coverage list. Now, the past four years of the media and technology worlds um, has truly been shocking in terms of what's happened. So when you look at this slide, this slide looks at the market capitalization. The value of the market is putting on the FANG stocks. So for FANG, we added Apple. So over the past four years, the four FANG stocks have added $1.5 trillion of market cap. Now, to put this in perspective, there's no companies that are worth $1.5 trillion. They've basically now moved to be three of the top five companies in the world um, in what we and how we value them. At the same time, the media industry, um, the content network industry, the studio industry, has lost about $40 billion in market cap. So it's been clear what we see on Wall Street says one industry is going to grow for a long time and accelerate that growth, and the other industry is, is, in, is, in, a, is in a deep state of distress. Now the question again that we've been wrestling with is what's the speed of that change and what's the duration of that change? Um, this is not surprising in terms of that change of market cap. This is one of the most important slides we have at our firm it looks at the pace of cord cutting. Anytime we write a note that says cord cutting, we got like a thousand reads. We, have to, we just write cord cutting all day long. It's everyone's favorite topic. But it's, it's actually pretty complicated because there are two types of cord cutting. If you look at that dark blue line that's falling pretty rapidly, that's the rate of cord cutting for traditional distributors. So that's Comcast, Charter, uh, Dish, DirecTV, Fios. So that speed of change is it's declining at 4%. So big bundle, traditional ways to watch television, it's a 4% decline. And we think in 2018, it gets worse. So if I just walked off the stage, and that's all you knew, it's pretty terrible. But as you heard yesterday from Peter Rice, there's a new, there's new growth of something called the virtual MVPDs. That's Hulu, YouTube TV, Sling, DirecTV Now. If I added back the growth we see at those places, and Peter said yesterday, four million subs by the end of A17, we think the rate of change is plus or minus negative 1%. And if you can see here, it really hasn't changed much in the past few years, right? So the question really is, where are your networks sitting? What types of, of content do you have? And again, we see it as a two-speed world. If you are only tied to traditional distributors, you're looking at a negative four, negative 5% rate. If you're lucky enough to be carried by those virtual new distributors, you look at negative 1%, which is, which is terrible uh, from where we used to be five, six, seven years ago, but it's not, it's not falling at a rapid rate. Now, this is more worrying to me. Um, and again, I said you recovered the, tr the, the digital uh, gatekeepers that three, four years ago. So put this in perspective, okay? Over the past four years, Google's advertising growth has grown by CAGR, meaning an annual growth rate, of about 18%. So Google was twice as big as NBC Universal's advertising base four years ago. Now they're four times as big as NBCU's advertising base. Facebook has grown by an annual growth rate of 60% for the past four years. Twitter's grown by 27%. Facebook was at one point almost as big as Viacom's advertising base. Now it's four times as big, okay? Now to the left side of this chart, you see all my traditional advertising companies, uh, you know, all the networks. And what you see here is, 
barely anyone has grown, right? The best grower has been AMC networks because of The Walking Dead. But in a healthy economy, in a non-recessionary cycle, we're looking at zero, one, or two percent advertising growth rate for traditional media companies, and that's truly worrying. And I would say that's 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 different than what we've seen happen on the cord cutting side. Now, a chart that I would say our second favorite chart that we publish a lot is the long-term change in advertising dollar share across the United States. So this looks at the rate of change by type of media. Okay, so. 20 years ago, digital was zero, more or less. Now digital is 44% of all ad spend. Go back 20 years ago, print was 45% of ad spending. It's now down to low teens. And TV, for the most part, has held in really, really well. Okay? So TV, even though it has not grown, you've not seen that collapse of share up until recently. And the point about 2017, 2017 was the first year in which digital advertising was a bigger segment than television advertising. So if I walked out of here and left this chart up, you would all think that you know, TV is, is dying pretty quickly. But what's happening, again, I showed you it's, it's zero growth. What's happening is that digital has done an amazing job on long tail, small and medium enterprises, direct response. Facebook said a couple years ago that 25% of their advertising base or top 100 advertisers, only 25. Why does that matter? If you ask CBS of their top 100 advertisers or, or NBC, the top 100 advertisers at a broadcast network are about 60%, 60% of their ad base, right? So what Facebook and Google have done is they've monetized the long tail of, of non-brand direct response dollars, and they've done it at a great, great rate, okay? So what has happened that has driven advertising to at best be flat the past couple of years. Um, and this starts getting to our disruption phase of the conversation. So if you look at it, GRPs or ratings points, that's been the source of all evil. Uh, we've, we've started watching te uh, television in a much different way. So if you look at ratings trends for cable networks the past four years, we've seen an average ratings decline of 5% per year, per year. And the past couple of years, that minus five has accelerated down to minus seven, minus eight. If you look at broadcast, it's been down about 4% per year, and you'll see why in a minute. Uh, if you, even if you go to C3, which is time-shifted, three days of viewing, you get a little bit of ad back for delayed viewing. But what's been happening and why we have you know, that, that soft uh, US advertising story on TV is the ratings are just not there, and we don't expect that to, to change anytime soon. So if I pulled back here and looked at the two biggest revenue drivers for US media, um, there are different rates of change. So one is, on the right side, you look at the five-year growth in a stable economy of national TV. So national TV is essentially flat over five years. You can see in 17, a non-Olympic year, it was actually down. 17 was the worst year for TV ad growth in a non-recession that I've ever seen. Now, the other side of the story is affiliate fees. The money that's paid by MVPDs, both traditional, like Comcast, and virtual like Hulu to broadcasters and cable nets. Now that growth rate has been 9% per year. Okay, that's a pretty good story, except in that 9% per year, there's a have and have nots of who's getting paid. So the question from here, right? So the past four years is totally understandable. You, under, you understand what, what the market sees and why the stocks do what they do. So the question that I'm here today to pose and hopefully the day helps answer is, what happens from here on out? Right? Is the path forward more like the music industry, which is a slow and sorry, music industry, which is a fast and rapid decline, or is it more like magazines, which is slow, steady, but ultimately painful, but it's slow and steady. So those that's how I think about the world in terms of you know the, the pace of change. Slow, steady, predictable, or rapid and painful. Okay, so as I said to you, the first thing I ever did in my life as an analyst was I was given the music industry. And I'd often go to trade shows in, in the late 90s, early 2000s, and I would depress the music audience. And I'd say to them, obviously there's a problem here. You kept pushing the bundle of the album to higher and higher price points, and most of the albums that are out there are not classics, right? There are one or two hit wonders that are $15.99 for a CD. So of course, piracy developed. And then in order to combat piracy, 
they worked with Apple to create a 99 cent download, which quickly unbundled a $16 album. And then as people moved to, to digital from physical, you saw a death of retailers. And I tell my kids all the time, yeah, there was a Tower Records once in New York that was a great place to go to buy records. And they don't even know what records mean. So, so, so when you see music, and this was my life for the first four years as an analyst. You know, so music, music sales in the US peaked in 1999 at about $14 billion, okay? The next decade, that decade that followed, music consumer spending fell in half in a decade, with the average decline being a 7% a year decline. As a manager, there's nothing you can do about this. You know, you're losing the high profit pool, CD dollars, you're offsetting with no margin, digital dollars, it's a bloody transition. And this looks at the global music picture, it's similar. So again, this peaked in uh, about 2001 with, with digital. And back then the pitch was, hey, digital is gonna offset physical. So as we lose physical sales, we're gonna offset with digital. And as you all know, that didn't happen. Now it's happening now, but literally took a decade to bottom out with about a four or five percent annual decline, right? So this is not a pretty picture. Having covered this industry, I see industries, industries in media today that remind me of this. I'll tell you about that later. Now, going back to my setup, before I was an analyst, I had the pleasure of working at the Time Inc. magazine company. A great place to work. Executive dining rooms, the second floor, drinks every Friday afternoon, shoe shines every Monday morning. It was an amazing place to work, okay? But ultimately, I knew it was doomed, and I left 20 years ago. Uh, but if you look at the long-run history of Time Incorporated, what you see is this. The lifestyle magazines, in style, people, real simple, they actually grew subscribers over the past 20 years. Because there was something about the magazine and the delivery of that content to their readers that stayed valuable throughout all the digital disruptions that we saw. Now in the middle, you see the subscriber changes for news magazines, Time Inc. and Sports Illustrated. And it's pretty logical to anyone here that as we get our news and sports information now on our phone so quickly, you don't need a weekly magazine or a weekly Sports Illustrated to give you insight into what just happened. So that's had very steep declines. And lastly, fortune and money. Given the rate of change again in information flow and how quickly markets respond, waiting for a monthly magazine to tell you what to do with your money seems like a dumb idea, right? So the reality is if you looked at the content verticals within Time Inc., they all were growing at very, very different rates. But if I pull back and look at the big picture of Time Inc., what you see again is a slow and steady disruption of a revenue base. So Time Incorporated had about a 3% annual decline in circulation revenue. Now 3% is not great, but it's not 7%, which I showed you with the music. And advertising for the longest time hung in, and then the recession came in 2010. What you see happen was a massive collapse of, of print advertising that never came back, and their digital initiatives were not big enough to offset the fall of print. Okay, so as you think about change, I want to reference a book. There's a Harvard Business School professor named Bharat Anand, and he wrote a book called The Content Trap, A Strategist's Guide to Digital Change. And for anyone in this room who cares about strategy and, and this industry, it, it's a great read because it helps set up how to think about your business going forward, right? So there's two types of products. One is a complementary product, right? A customer values that product more when she has the complementary product than when she has your product alone. So for example, if you were watching sports in HD in 2008 on a non-HD TV set, you missed something. So as the price of HD TV sets came down, the value of live sports on, on live sports networks has, went up. Uh, on the substitute side, substitutes should be expensive. If you're willing to trade one economic choice for another, substitutes should be expensive, complements should be cheap. The best substitute we found and the mistake in substitution was the Apple download story, right? So Apple downloads were 99 cents, no price flexibility. Uh, the album was $16, so you were basically were substituting a $16 product for a 99 cent uh, substitute, right? So when I think about the world going forward, and all the new initiatives we see, is it substitute or is it complement, right? So in the time that I have left, I wanna talk about four current trends that are disrupting our industry and then give you a sense of where I think the business is in terms of is it magazines 
or is it, is it music? So the four changes are one is obviously growth of SPOD. Second is the growth of those virtual MVPDs we've talked about. The third is the fragmentation of young viewers. And the fourth is the breaking of the, the back end film business. Okay? So first, SVOD. And when we talk about SVOD in shorthand, it's Netflix, it's Amazon, it's Hulu. Okay? Uh, sorry. So my takeaway on Netflix is this. I think it's clear as day when I show you the slides, and it's obviously I'm in this room, that Netflix has disrupted the consumption of non live and non essential content. And what I've done here, just for a little shorthand, is I put together uh, a chart that looks at Nef Netflix's PL spending. So this is not even a cash spend. So last year, Netflix spent $6.3 billion on their PL buying content, mostly television. They're going to move to film, make 80 films this year, so film is going to really balloon. When we look at their PL this year, it's seven to $8 billion of content spending. On a cash basis, it's 10 to 11, 11 to $12 billion of content spending. When you line that up with the biggest conglomerates, it's quickly you know, passing Time Warner. It's bigger and it's going to be bigger than Fox. Fox Disney together is a, a bigger, obviously, combination. But they're reaching a size in investment spending that really challenges um, linear scripted networks. Now, if I back off sports, uh, you could argue that their spending on content is actually bigger than everyone else but NBCU um, in 2018. And we look at the growth of SVOD, my takeaway is this. Unless the digital gatekeepers can crash the live sports, live news, big events, that type of content, I think subscription revenues for the people who own those types of assets are going to probably look more like magazine, meaning slow, steady, you know, predictable decline. Why do I say that is because what we've done is we've gone through all the ratings of the top broadcasters and the top cable networks over the past seven years. And we've bucketed viewing into two distinct buckets. There's, on the right side, what you see is all viewing of live content, live sports, live news, live events. And maybe you're surprised to know that over the long run, this is four or five years, but it's true over seven years, the viewing of, of live content has essentially been flat. Okay? On the flip side, the viewing of non-live content, things that are not sports news events, is down by a keg or 5%. And that, that's accelerating in 2017, right? So when I look at my world, I always ask myself, how much of their content's live? How much, how much of what they have is uh, proprietary, cannot be replaced by an SVOD service? This is some of my favorite, my favorite charts. Um, this looks at the top 100 telecasts and broadcasting and cable uh, in the 2011 TV season, sorry, 2011 calendar season, and doesn't include the, the playoff games of the NFL, okay? The blue bars represent non-sports programming. The red bars represent sports programming. No more than six or seven years ago, the most highly rated, biggest reach products were blend of sports and scripted. If I fast forward to last season, it's all red, right? So the only products out there that are capturing High percentage of Americans in one fill swoop is live sports. Our view long term is that the only advertising play that's going to be valuable long term is this live reach of live sports. And I bet you come here two, three years ago, it's pretty much all going to be red. So we've done a lot of work on the NFL. We've been very negative about the NFL's ratings. But still, in terms of what's valuable in the TV ecosystem for advertisers, having this type of unduplicated live reach is why the dollars have not come out of TV yet. And you heard this yesterday with Peter Rice saying they're willing to double down and spend a lot more money on NFL because I think they see what, what, they, what we know, which is it's really hard to build a network in prime time on scripted content. Live sports is the only way we're going to hold on to our affiliate dollars and our ad dollars. Okay. So we would say to you where we think, you know, what worries us in terms of what could be music like in its decline. So cable networks that are driven by repeats, and commodity content to us are in trouble. Uh, for a shorthand, we added together TNT, TBS, FX, USA, and Nick and Knight. We looked at their change of ratings of acquired content. So a family guy is sitting on Netflix, um, and you can watch that on Netflix, or, family, or CSI is on Netflix or Hulu. At some point, networks that are built out of repeat content are going to see big erosion. And in fact, that's what's happened. The past four years, erosion 
of acquired content on these big entertainment networks, it's down about 9% a year. You can't recover from 9% a year declines. Now what you see happen is you've seen TBS and TNT smartly move to add more sports. Because what they've realized is, look, the audience is going to be held by more NCAA basketball, by, by NBA basketball. So if the choice is scripted or sports, they, they move to sports. Now the, the, the falling of audience has also made the middle chart, the middle bars jump out, which is as they try to program new original content, you're seeing a real decline in original scripted content uh, ratings. That's down 20% CAGR the past four years. Okay, so a place that we would say we're truly worried about the speed of change is general entertainment cable networks. Another place we're very worried about it is the bottom in the middle of broadcast prime time. So what this looks at is, it looks at the bottom 10 rated original shows on broadcast the past four years. So the bottom has literally dropped out of broadcast. So the average rating is now down 7% per year CAGR. And again, what Fox did on Thursday was probably say, look, our Thursday lineup is not getting traction. We're spending four to five million dollars an hour to try to build a prescriptive lineup. Let's just commit to the NFL and, and stop trying to kid ourselves that we can launch more scripted content on, on that low rating. Okay, so the second, second disruption is, is virtual MVPDs. These are the six of them. There's, there's a couple more uh, files here today, so we put their logo up. So these are, these are skinny bundle products, and as I showed you earlier, the skinny bundles are adding back a level of growth back to the ecosystem. So there's a bit of celebratory uh, backslap on, hey, we, we've stopped some of the bleeding. The only problem that we see is this. When Craig and I, Craig Moffat and I, do the math on skinny bundles, not follow, because follow's got a different model, but the, the big bundles uh, of sports and news stripped down for 35 to $40, our math says, there's no profit there. So we're getting this profitless growth on the distribution side, and we wonder at what point do these virtual distributors pull back and say, you know what, this is, this is not it's, you know, I can see why Hulu's doing it. They're owned by you know, four conglomerates. I can see why YouTube's doing it. It's a way into the house. But for the others, it's, it's a profitless future. Now, making it worse going forward is that the networks they've chosen to be the, the bedrock of those virtual services Fox, NBC's, Disney's, um, Time, Time Wars, and CBS's, it's pretty much where all the growth in that affiliate fee bucket is. So if I showed you before, the growth rate for their affiliate fees are 9% in aggregate. Some are higher, some are lower. But the problem you have is if you're a virtual network, you have a $35 price point, but your cost of goods sold is going to be inflating at a very, very high rate. So at some point you have to decide whether or not you raise your pricing, which could limit your growth, or you just absorb it and assume it's a loss leading product. So that's a place that worries us. Uh, some of that worries us too, and this has been a long trend and you've seen it published before, is this is a look at something called putts. Uh, people using TV, shorthand, it's basically, it's a measure of did you turn on the TV today? And if you look at it, the red line here looks at people over the age of 55. In that world, their usage is only down 1% over the long run. They may have Netflix, they're not using Netflix. They may have Hulu, they're not using Hulu. They may have Facebook and Twitter, they're not on there. They're watching TV like it's 1975, right? So if, so <laughs> if, if, if you've got a network built on 55 plus, you're, you're not seeing the same level of decay as these younger networks. So if you're targeted to 211, to 12 to 17, to 18 to 24, you're looking at double-digit declines in people turning on the TV set, right? Now, they may be turning on their iPads, their phones to watch your content, but the way Nielsen is measuring it, which is people using TV sets, the rate of change is happening at a, a rate that, again, reminds me of music, and I don't see any way to, to, to dig out of that. Um, my, last, my last section is on the film business. And, and everyone spends their time, and I did too, all these charts are on TV, this is on film. To me, film is a much more precarious place than television, actually, because we've kind of ignored what's been happening. So this will not be much of a, of a, of a headline grabber. This looks at home video spending over 2010, 2017. The bottom two bars are physical home video sales and physical rental. Not a surprise that over the 10 years, the physical bit of home video has fallen from $16 billion down to $6 billion. So I'm not here today to tell you the home video business, the physical business is dead. 
No more blockbusters, no one's buying, no one's renting physical DVDs. But what I'm here to tell you is the growth of the digital format, so electronic sell-through, video on demand, is starting to slow, right? It's starting to slow. And that slowing has now caused real concern about the long-term growth. You know, we once thought that could, that could add back the decline of physical. It's not happening. The, wor the worry in physical now is that physical is bulk of what's bought in physical uh, DVDs from Target, Walmart, Best Buy. And just a matter of years, as I showed you about Tower Records, that those companies start downsizing their, 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 their carrying of physical products. So we're very, very worried about the back-end monetization of the film business. And that's going to lead to more premium VOD. Premium VOD is basically um, it's a model that, that lets you buy movies closer to day and date. 2017 was the worst theatrical box office year we've seen since 95. And as Netflix spends more money to make better and better movies, moves to day and date release schedule, as premium VOD windows start opening up, we see pressure on the theatrical side of the business. So we're really we're worried about that. So with the time I have left, I know Ed's going to talk to me, but the takeaway from all this is, look, there's definitely speeds of change that the whole business is not music. There are places to be really worried about that look like music. In the short run, what you've seen is massive consolidation in rapid pace. Fox, Disney happened out of nowhere. Time Warner, AT&T, a year and a half ago, out of nowhere. Scripps Discovery, quickly. You're seeing deck chairs get, get, get repositioned. People are moving around, trying to find cost synergies, trying to get scale versus distributors, trying to find some ways to the consumer with enough you know, library content. So this is all happening in real time, and hopefully that makes a lot of sense. So with that, I think we have questions and Ed here. So thank you for having me. Wow, that was pretty depressing. <laughs> uh, oh, there's some hope there. There's some hope there. All right, so we'll, we've got a little bit of time to take some audience questions, so think about it and go, go up to the mic. But before we get there, I have a question of my own. Um, TV guys are actually still doing OK. They're dying, but a slow death, not a fast death, like uh, magazines, not music. Right. right? Um, it seems to me the big part of that is they still hold the big brand advertisers. Facebook and Google, they've got the direct response advertisers, right? There's this big gap in between, yep. right? Is there anyone who can fill that in-between gap? Who, who can win that middle ground of win, winning the big brand advertisers away from TV? Yeah. So there's two, I have two answers for you. One is Netflix doesn't have advertising, but Netflix has a ton of, of reach. At what point do they say, we're creating two price points? One is with advertising, one's without. And they just add a minute you know, every hour of commercials and take some of those dollars away. The second thing is when Susan yesterday talked about NFL, I think one of your... YouTube, right. Yeah, YouTube. Someone asked her from the audience from... from we, your, we asked, it's like, would you like the NFL? And I'm still flabbergasted that Google does not see, YouTube does not see the value of aggregating large live audiences. It seems to me like if you want to take dollars away, so when everyone asks us that question, we always say the answer is in 2021 when the next set of NFL rights come due to see if all the, the digital players step up and buy those rights exclusively. Now, Amazon bought rights last time, but Facebook and, and uh, YouTube are still kind of not giving you a clear they don't, answer. They don't have the, they're not shelling at the big dollars. They're not going for the $3 billion deal yet, exactly. yeah, but I think that's an interesting point. Yeah. All right, we've got a bunch of people up here. Don. Don. What's your favorite media stock currently and why? Okay, oh, uh, thank you, Don. Um, That's a little bit loaded there, but yeah, go ahead. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I like Fox and Disney. So we have buys on Fox and Disney, okay? On both. Yeah, we have buys on Fox. And buying Fox gets you, you get Disney at the current valuation. And Fox, what Peter said yesterday. Peter Rice. Yeah, you know, Peter Rice, where he's pretty right. aggressive. It's like they just spent $300 million more than the other bid to get the NFL. When you look at their Fox's network, it's pretty much a sports network, right? They get $1.50 a month for affiliate fees. ESPN gets eight, right? So he's got a lineup of sports that rivals. It's probably better than ESPN in terms of live NFL. So it seems like that, that those stock picks are based on the idea that Disney will buy Fox, and yes. so you know you'll, they'll both win out. In right, the you're getting right. Fox very cheaply you, because Disney is a part of Fox right now. So that's the answer. Right. Yep. Question up here. <clears throat> Last fall, you and Craig put out a really interesting interpretation of what was happening with net neutrality. Um, could you um, reprise that here and update it to your current thoughts? Yeah, that's, um, that's such a loaded question. That's such a big question, right? So, okay, so it's Craig's, it's Craig's favorite topic to talk about, right? We actually think what's going to happen is unless 
Congress wants to step into this hornet's nest, right? That the current strategy of net neutrality, which is like just backing off and letting the market figure this out, to us is going to stand for a while. I, you know, I'm not giving our experience because it's, it's Craig's real domain, but I would say to you, I think the companies will all say we're not going to disrupt the current regime of net neutrality. Whether or not we believe in them, we'll find out. But I think they'd be crazy to start tampering with a structure that we as consumers all have supported, right? You start playing around with all of our broadband speeds and our packaging, you're going to have a battle, I think, in Washington. So I think they're smart enough not to escalate this issue, right? So I'm not giving you a great answer because it's Craig's, it's Craig's work, truth be told. But we're less, we're, we're really bullish on cable stocks for that reason, right? So Comcast, Charter, Altice, we see the ability to take pricing in broadband as a huge differentiator. We have a pretty real, realistic view on, on video, but we think the broadband pricing and the ability to take pricing based on speed is now a huge opportunity in the next three years under this current administration. Okay, we got two more quick yep. questions we could do. Really quick. A hey, quick question. Uh, so depending on your mobile subscription, you can get HBO or uh, Hulu included, and recently Viacom announced a sort of essentially a carriage deal with Telefonica. What's your thoughts on mobile stepping in to save the day? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a great topic. I tell you what, that's a place where we've been most surprised, and I think we've got to go back and revisit the addressable universe. So we look at like like a Netflix. We always base addressable universe on number of broadband homes or, or number of TV homes. But the fact is you're now getting enough mobile bundling that I think it totally expands TAM for everyone in the industry. It's a great question. You're seeing it play out in people's numbers today. Okay. Rich, yeah. last one. Last one. Hello, Rich. Hey, Michael, I never get to do this. I know. And this is an analyst question, another analyst, folks. Yes. So this is, a this is probably a first. Okay, let's, exactly. let's get to this. What, is, what do you got? Uh, so real quick. So uh, Hulu's losing probably upwards of a billion and a half to $2 billion in the coming year. Um, has 85% fewer subscribers than Netflix. W why do you think Hulu's struggling so much relative to Netflix to grow its subscriber base? It's got 17 million versus I think Netflix with 117 million. And, and then just maybe attached to that, you talked about why you really like Disney and Fox and just wondering how you kind of you tie that into the consumer side of it when you think about how Netflix is positioned against those two companies. Yeah, second question first. I think what we showed here is that Netflix's disruptions happen on the scripted side. And when I look at the value that Disney brings, it's, it's scripted. I, you know, the disruption is to me not on the live side. So I've always reconciled, look, I've not walked away from being bearish. We're bearish on the old cable nets. But I looked at the value of live sports and like all the work we've ever done has showed the value of live sports. So as the bundle shrinks, my view is the people who stay in the bundle will pay more for lives. So the bundle in my world breaks into a live bundle. Peter said this yesterday, kind of, and the rest of the world moves to on demand filled out by SVOD. So it may be a smaller, smaller ARPU down the road, smaller revenue base, but a higher take rate. So that's, that's second. I don't know. We, we could debate that. We could do a whole other day on that. We'll, we'll have to do But, but on the first question, you know, you would agree with this. You know, who has been run by a consortium of conflicting interest, right? And you would agree because you're your own analyst. If you had to make every stock call with four people deciding what to do, you, get, you wouldn't get anything done. Um, who in my world, in my view, they've never had a clear consumer message of what are we offering you? Is it original content? Is it catch-up TV? Isn't that catch-up TV free online? So I think it's a really been a messaging problem. One of the questions I have for, for Disney, and then later you could ask us, we both ask it is, how does Disney see Hulu? Is Hulu a brand on its own? Does Disney Channel become part of that, Disney Kids? And does their adult product fit in that? Because I think Hulu should, should be reworked across all three you know, product sets. It's a great question. So, Good things to think about yeah. for the rest of the day with all these Thank you, Rich. Thanks a lot, okay. guys.